T-SPAN is your unfiltered view of government, so you can make up your own mind. And this week on The Communicators, we want to introduce you to Andy Purdy. He is a Chief Security Officer at Huawei Technologies USA. Mr. Purdy, what does that role entail? Well, primarily it's an internal role. Uh, I chair a U.S.-wide committee for cybersecurity and privacy that is similar to the one that we have globally, where you have representatives of each business group, IT, human relations, services, et cetera that meets quarterly to manage the requirements for cybersecurity and privacy, to make sure that we are meeting uh, statutory, regulatory, customer requirements and our own internal policies so that we can, we can manage risk from a cybersecurity and privacy perspective. I also work with my government relations and public relations people to talk with customers, talk with stakeholders about issues uh, and, and try to drive the conversation forward. Give us a snapshot, if you would, of Huawei. Well, Huawei is a company with over 180,000 people uh, around the world. About 30% of our products come from Huawei. Uh, about 30, 32% of the components of our products come from the United States, about $11 billion a year. Um, we are an employee-owned company. Uh, we have, I think, about 80,000 people involved in R&D. We spent $15 billion in R&D last year, which is one of the most important factors and one of the advantages of being private. We don't have to worry about the quarterly numbers. We can invest in the long term, and, and that's what we're doing. Our people are motivated essentially by two things. They want to be, we want to be involved in something that is very interesting and very important, and we want to provide well for our families, and, and I think we're doing, doing both of those. Who's the founder? Um, Mr. Wren. And where, what's his background? Well, he was an engineer, and I'm not an expert in it. He was a civil engineer uh, with the People's Liberation Army many, many years ago. Uh, and he moved to form his own company with four or five others with a, a few thousand dollars. And he's had a spectacular growth, not unprecedented in terms of other companies from the late 80s, such as Cisco, that have had dramatic growths also. But he has always incentivized people uh, to, to produce uh, to innovate uh, and to be customer-centric. That's the, the primary focus of Huawei is to be customer-centric, to understand their needs and their potentials, and to help meet those. And it's not to get every dollar of profit out of every particular contract, it's to take a long view that if our customers make money and their customers make money, we're all working well together for a, for a common advantage. Do any of us in this room right now have a Huawei product in our hand or in our phones or anything? Well, I have a Huawei phone. I left it in the other room. But uh, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Why is Huawei considered a threat to national security here in the U.S.? Well, it's a complicated issue. There's not a simple answer to it. There is a geopolitic overlay of the issues related to Huawei. They're steeped in ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, the rise of China economically and militarily in the world. Uh, the reach of China through the Belt and Road Initiative to Africa and, and, and around the world, the advances in technology by Africa, some, uh, the advances in technology by China, excuse me. Uh, some of the issues that the U.S. government has with China uh, have, have been a, a, a major concern, that some of which are the subject of the trade talks, some of may have been deferred to, to future conversations. So the U.S. is not safe in cyberspace. And so the U.S. looks at things from a risk perspective, whether it's national security or other risks. And from a national security perspective, they don't just look at companies or countries who are uh, hostile to us from a national security perspective. They look at potential. Does a, comp does a country have the opportunity and capabilities if they turn against the United States to cause us great harm. And so it's that kind of a risk-based perspective that is affecting uh, the perspective of, of the U.S. Uh, toward Huawei. It, it's really much a country focus, much more than a company focus. Well, let's bring Drew Fitzgerald of the Wall Street Journal into this conversation. He covers telecom and technology. Thanks for having me. Uh, Andy, I'm, I'm curious. There have been uh, rules proposed and rules enacted in the U.S. that have essentially all but banned Huawei equipment from being involved in most uh, telecom networks, wireless and wireline networks in the U.S. So what's the status of Huawei's business operations in America now? 
Well, we have about 1,500 employees in the United States. There's a, we have a very strong R&D presence. And as I mentioned, we purchased about $11 billion in, in U.S. components last year. Our business groups, our carrier business, our enterprise, uh, and our consumer business, um, we are maintaining uh, our revenues at present. Uh, the prohibitions in the National Defense Authorization Act, I think, kick in in August of 2019, and those are focused on government contracts, which we do not and are not pursuing, uh, and government contractors. Uh, and so th there may be a greater potential impact going forward. We believe that in the end, the United States is going to have the kinds of measures in cyberspace that are going to make the, us a whole lot more secure. Um, when we get to that point, we think we're going to be allowed to compete on a level playing field. Uh, but in the meantime, our biggest concern is probably our tier three wireless customers that serve rural America. We believe that our technologies and the services we provide them are essential to farmers and schools and citizens and companies in, in the rural parts of the United States. So we hope we can maintain that service to serve those people. And you continue doing business with those small or rural uh, providers in the United States? Yes, we have about 40 uh, of those customers, yes. Um, in uh, Around the world, there's been a lot of focus on flaws that have been found in code or vulnerabilities in certain Huawei equipment in places like Italy and the places like UK, the UK. Is it possible to secure uh, Huawei devices and networks that run off of them, or is that a pipe dream? Well, it's impossible to eliminate all risk, whether it's 5G or enterprises or whatever. It's impossible to eliminate all vulnerabilities in products. One of the advantages we have, and I do see it as an advantage, is that we are probably one of the most examined and evaluated companies in the world. So the flaws that we have, such as the UK Oversight Board revealed in terms of our software engineering processes, those are the kinds of things that we can improve as part of a continuous improvement process. And that's the kind of thing that we think to make America safer, to make cyberspace safer. Those kinds of risk mitigation measures, looking for those kinds of vulnerabilities, protecting the threats that exist out there, we need to protect against those risks from all vendors. All the major vendors have major operations in China, so if there's concern about the China government, we've got to make sure that we protect against all those threats. And how does that work? How do these boards examine millions of lines of code, very complex equipment, 